Hi, I'm John Ed Matheson, and thank you for giving me this privilege of sharing some ideas and thoughts about things that are happening in today's world and how we can respond to them from a Christian perspective. I want to thank Ellen uh, for giving me this opportunity. I was with her a few years ago. She was just a real youngster, and she remembered my name. And so what I've tried to look at is what's going on today, and the two big issues have to do mostly with the pandemic, the coronavirus, and I've tried to open up by saying in general one on how do you face a giant, uh, whatever the giants are, but sort of focus in on that. And then I've done two of the lessons on how we deal with that, how our world can fall into place, and also how we can have a new normal. Today I want to look at another thing that's confronting us so much is the whole area of race relations. Uh, back on May the 25th, George Floyd died at the hand or the foot of a policeman. That's created a tremendous response around the world as to what's going on. <clears throat> race relations. I'd like to just ask the question is, uh, how do we respond in a responsible biblical way? Let me tell you what happened. You started having riots about the next week and there were protests that turned into riots. Buildings were burned, places were looted. Um, on June the 1st, it looked like there was a lot of plans to come into Montgomery. In fact, there were a lot of words out. The police had put up some barricades in different places. A lot was being expected, but let me just share with you that in Montgomery, things have been quite different. First, our mayor, we have the first African-American mayor, and he had called a press conference. In that <clears throat> press conference, a lot of us were there, and there were some very v people that were just preparing that night to put together. They said they had over 100 folks ready to come down and would get others and there's going to be just tremendous uh, distress and a lot of just tearing up and burning down and protesting. But the mayor handled it in such a good way. And some of us were able to talk to some of the people that were planning to do it. Then somebody called me and said, why don't you have a press conference? The next morning, I asked uh, three black pastors and two other white pastors if we together could just have a press conference and speak to the city uh, I'd been here for a long time. Actually, out of the two whites and the three blacks that I that we put together, I had over 180 years. I mean, we'd spent our lives here in Montgomery. We were able to, at press conference, it was carried by the local TV stations. It was actually placed on their Facebook. And in fact, you can go to it and watch it if you'd like it. There's been over 100,000 people have watched it on Facebook that press conference, and each of us just spoke and just said, here's some things that we want to highlight and we want to do in this community. Well, that led me to think, well, what can I do? What can I do? And that's what I want to focus on today. I want to share with you some things that I've come up with for myself. I think they would be applicable to any person. And you may have other ideas and other things. The point is that we must act in some way responsibly for our world to go forward. So I want to just list six things and there'll be some biblical references and I'll uh, try to illustrate somewhat what I have discovered or think that I can do. And I'd like for us to look at it. Every citizen in the city of Montgomery ought to receive and enjoy all of the privileges that we have, the opportunities. And so we just have been working now the six of us pastors have met. Uh, we've had a couple of other press conferences. We're doing a lot of specific things that I won't get into at this time, but, but we're acting on what we had said we wanted to do. Well, six things. First, I think I need to listen. All of us need to listen. We need to listen to each other. Uh, that night, as it looked like a lot of folks were going to just try to burn things down, uh, our mayor just listened. Our police chief just listened. Some pastors just listened. And the folks were amazed that somebody would listen to them and just ask them the question, hey, I hear what you said. Tell us how we can be helpful to you. What can we do? And they could believe. The whole area of listening just diffused a lot of the anger. Listening is important. Uh, I, one day I read where a teacher 
had asked uh, students, would you differentiate between listening and hearing? And nobody answered. Finally, one little boy spoke up and he said this, listening is wanting to hear. Most of us don't listen well. We've got, uh, remind us, we've got two ears and one mouth. We ought to listen twice as much as we speak. And, you know, when I'm talking, I don't learn anything. When I'm listening, I can learn. And so the point of listening is to learn. So we just became intentional. We, we, we've had some forms. We, we've intentionally had some people that we've sat down one-on-one -on -one and listened to. Uh, we, we elected not to have a big crowd because that can get out of control, but, but with just a few people, listen. Let me do what I've learned from a lot of the African-American people, things I didn't know, uh, situations in which they're engaged. Uh, the three pastors with whom I've been working there, th th these guys are, are the foot soldiers. I mean, they're out there and they're, they're dealing with things and what they've shared with me and the relationship that we form is just to listen. A couple of passages of scripture. Uh, we've got to listen to God first. And then when we listen to God, we've got to listen to each other. In fact, Moses said, Israel, be quiet and listen. Deuteronomy 27, 9. Be quiet, stop, listen. And then God said, for all who listen to me will live in peace. That's Proverbs 133. You know, we don't really know until we begin to listen. So we've had some listening posts. We've set up some venues. I intentionally have been listening. Let me just ask you a question. When have you sat down with somebody of a different race or nationality and just listened, just listened. And a good thing just to ask is, what am I gonna do? To whom could I listen? Is my church, are we listening to what people are saying? Listen to God and listen to people. The first thing is to listen. Now, the second thing is to learn. I wanna learn. You see, listening, sets up the opportunity or the platform for learning. Because when you listen, we begin to learn. We begin to hear the stories of other people and we learn. And let me tell you what I've discovered. Learning brings change. Learning, learning about God. Learning about how he wants us to deal with people. Learning, and the more we learn, and, and let me just share one aspect of learning that I've discovered in race relations. God can change anybody, anytime, anywhere. Now, people say, well, hey, in race relations, you can't change people's, hey, God can change it. Now, if I didn't believe that God could change people, I, I wouldn't want to be engaged in this. But God can change. I'm going to give you a couple of examples. Now, number one was Governor George Wallace. He was the icon of segregation. Remember, he stood in the schoolhouse door at Tuscaloosa and said, segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. And he was the icon for segregation. But let me do what happened in his life. God changed his way of thinking. God changed, and George Wallace began to follow Christ and learn, and he discovered, hey, I've done wrong to black people. I've done wrong by talking about segregation. And he, he wanted to confess his sins. Now, 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And George Wallace did that. You remember he was shot. Part of that was that his hearing was greatly impaired. My relation came to him because he watched our worship services on television. And then he would call me multiple times and ask me to come by. And he, I would go by his house. He, he couldn't hear well, couldn't speak well. He used a blackboard to write on a lot. He said, will God forgive me? And, and I tried the best I could along with some other folks. Yes, God will forgive you. If you confess God, God can change you. And then he showed me a letter from the Pope 
and a letter from Billy Graham saying the same thing that God would forgive him. But he said, I still don't know that for sure. Now, let me tell you, I went by multiple times. Before he died, I had the privilege of being in his bedroom, and I remember there that uh, with a smile on his face, he wrote on the blackboard, I know that God has forgiven me and that black people have forgiven me. I had some black folks go by, and, and one of the pastors I'm working with, he, he said, I, I didn't think that could happen, but I witnessed it and I saw it. Now, now listen to me. If God could change the life of George Wallace, he can change the life of anybody. And that is just the marvelous message of the gospel. Race relations, God can change attitudes and lives. Let me give you one other example. By the way, there are several folks from Frazier who are now at the villages. Uh, some of the best people we had are there. They'll remember a guy named Tommy Waits. He was a prisoner. Our church went out and had worship services at the prison. He got saved. God changed his life. And then after a while, he could get out on release form if he could get a job, but nobody would give him a job. So these guys in the ministry, they just came and said, well, we need to hire him at the church. You see, they had continued to disciple him every week after he had confessed his sins, had become a Christian. So we gave him a job at the church. He gave him a broom. He was supposed to be cleaning. And what happened was every time somebody would come by and speak to him, he'd say, let, let me tell you what this church did. They introduced me to Jesus. Let me tell you what God's done in my life. And we discovered he talked more than he swept. But he was an inspiration to people. Now, I want to tell you about a Sunday school class. Many of the folks that you know there can verify this. Know Nancy James taught a large class. And she invited Tommy Waits to come speak to the class. Uh, they had sometimes 175 people in the class. And when I say a class, it was a big class. She was a marvelous teacher. And Tommy Waits, now he's a big African-American guy, about 6'3", big guy. And when he came up, he was going to speak. And as he did, he just said, I want to thank this church for coming to the prison and the difference it's made in my life. And then he said, I want to confess to you. As a black man, I hated white people. But especially, I hated policemen. But God changed my life, and instead of hating white people, I love you all. And instead of hating policemen, I love policemen. Now, sitting on the front row, there was a guy named Wes Strain, a white guy. He's an ex-policeman. Well, he is an ex-policeman. He's not an ex-white, but he's still white, but he's an ex-policeman. And he's about as big as Tommy, about 6'3", and he stood up. And he looked and he said, I got to tell y'all something. I grew up hating black people, but Jesus changed my life. And now I love black people, but the black folks I hated most were convicts. I hated them. But God changed my life and I love convicts. So picture this in front of that Sunday school class. Here's West Strain and here's Tommy Waits. And as they started forward, Tommy sticks out his hand to shake his hand. And West Strain said, we can do better than that, brother. And they just embraced in a big bear hug and stood there. Now, let me tell you, that was the best lesson that I think was ever taught in the church I served at Fraser. It was a demonstration of the fact that God could change lives. Let me tell you what I've learned. I've learned that in race relations, <laughs> God doesn't have any limits. He can change anybody, anytime, anywhere. So I'm listening, and then I'm learning, and I'm learning what God can do. And then the third thing, and I'll be a little bit quicker with these, is that not only am I learning, but I'm going to lean. I'm going to lean on God. As we approach how we apply what God's grace is going to do, I'm going to lean on God's wisdom. You see, the problem is it's easy for me to lean on what I think is right. But what we need to do is lean on what God teaches us. Uh, we, we are smart people today. We brag about how much education we have. We brag about how smart we are. Hey, we're not really very smart. 
Uh, we got a lot of knowledge, but we don't always know how to apply it. We need to lean on God and what to do. A couple of passages of scripture, Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in God and don't lean on your own understanding. Yeah, that's a good principle just for life. Trust in God and don't lean on your own understanding. And part of the reason is that God has such a bigger, bigger dream than anything else for any of us. I mean, his is big. It's huge. In fact, in Isaiah 55, 9, he said, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Um, can I just say this? We need to lean on God. How can we go about having relationships? Race relations become what they should be. I mean, any of the problems we face in our country, we need to be focused on God and trusting on him and leaning on his understanding. He, he's thinking so big as to what can be. Um, th this past week, one of the great, great people born down in Troy, Alabama, John Lewis, he was the third of a lot of children, about 10, born to a sharecropper. Now, what chance would he ever have in life as a sharecropper? He was just a little boy. But let me tell you, God's plan is so much bigger than any of us could ever conceive. Uh, as a little boy, he carried his Bible to school. They called him preacher. He was a black boy. He didn't have the privileges. They called him preacher. On his little sharecropping place there, his parents had some chickens. And they said that John Lewis would line the chickens up over in the corner and preach to them. And later on, he said, you know, the chickens listen better than most of the folks I tried to speak to later in life. In fact, uh, they said he tried to baptize some of the chickens and they didn't like being baptized. Let me tell you what happened to that little boy as a sharecropper. What chance did he have? He went from the cotton fields of Alabama to the Congress of the United States of America. And I hope you tell every young person you meet, regardless of their race, Regardless, it doesn't matter so much where you started, it's where you wind up and where God wants to carry you. And the tremendous, tremendous way that God thinks about how big things are. Just parenthetically, let me say this as a nation. We spend so much, and I love the military. I'm for that. Maxwell Air Force Base is right here in Montgomery. We need a strong, strong military force. But ultimately, our defense is not going to be in our military. We need a strong economy. We've had the best economy ever, but our ultimate faith is not going to be in our economy. I mean, we could go on down the line in education and everything. Let me tell you where our ultimate faith needs to be. It's in God. We need to lean on God. In Psalm 127, number verse 1, David said, Unless the Lord guards a city, those who guard it do so in vain. We need to be looking. Hey, God, we want to trust you. I want to lean on you. That's where we go. So I've been trying to listen, and I'm learning, and I'm leaning. Now, the fourth thing, all of that would lead naturally to love. What can I do in racial relations? I can love people. I can love all people. John 3, 16 said, For God so loved the world. I mean, that's the world. That's everybody. He said that whosoever, in all of language, whosoever is the biggest word there is. Because whoever, whosoever, and that's who we love. We put love into action. Uh, I mentioned Representative John Lewis. He, his whole, what he learned from Martin Luther King, and he learned that nonviolent and love was the way to go. Now, let me tell you what's sort of troubling to me today. I've had some people of both races say to me, well, love might have worked back in their day, but it doesn't work today. I think that's wrong and false. I think the answer to race relations and to our problems is that we love God first and then we love each other. And love is so powerful. 
John Lewis, I mean, he began to stand up for what he thought was right. You see, John Lewis, as a boy, was sort of taken under the wing by Martin Luther King. He taught him nonviolence. Now, most of us, I can't imagine what he went through. John Lewis was one of the <clears throat> 13 Freedom Riders that came on the bus to the Greyhound Station in Montgomery and was severely beaten. <clears throat> he, he, he just was doing what God wanted him to do. And then in Selma, he was up front. There were five, four, five hundred people crossing the Edmund Pettus Bridge. He was right up front and was one of the first that was beaten with a billy stick by the highway patrol, fractured his skull, broke a couple of ribs. He said, I thought I was going to die that day. And people said, well, man, you're, you're crazy, this nonviolent stuff. That's not the way you do it. He said, oh, yes, it is. He said, I'd rather die doing it the right way than try to be victorious doing it some other way. He said, he wasn't going to burn things down. He wasn't going to get up something that would overthrow everything. It's nonviolent. It's love. Now, hey, if you think about it, that's the way Jesus did things. Now, they couldn't conceive that he would die on a cross, but he did, and he was willing to do that. Um, John Lewis made this statement just a, about a month or so before he died. He said, rioting, looting, and burning is not the way. Be constructive, not destructive. History has proven over time and again that nonviolent, peaceful protest is a way to achieve the justice and equality that we all deserve. It was through love. Uh, everything he did, Matthew 22, 36 through 40, you got to love God, then love your neighbor as yourself. That's the way that we go. Let me give you a couple of verses of scripture over in 1 John 4, 7. John said, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God. And then he makes a classic statement down there. He said it in verse 20, if somebody says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. So let me tell you what I'm learning. I'm learning when I lean on God, then I love, and my love is for all people. Now, fifth thing we mentioned, I lift. I lift other people. In, in, in race relations, we need to lift each other up. There are a lot of folks that haven't had the chances that we have had. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5.11, build each other up. Ecclesiastes 4.10 says, if one person tries to stand alone, it's dangerous because if he falls, there's nobody available to help him up. Hey, I've been down at some times in life and some people came and lifted me. In life today, everybody needs, we need to be ready to lift. Sometimes we need to be lifted and sometimes we need to be the lifter. We must be open to lifting people, helping people. It might be an encouraging word. Um, by the way, you want, I'm on the board of directors of, of a great, great, <clears throat> I think the best educational model anywhere in the country is Valiant Cross Academy. V-A-L-I-E-N-T, Valiant Cross. You might uh, just Google it. The most amazing thing with at-risk boys that's happening. Their theme is Rise Above. They're taking boys that didn't have a chance in life. And now I tell you, boy, they're doing marvelous, miraculous things. And they're rising above. They're being lifted. Let me tell you, a lot of folks who don't get a fair shake, women didn't get a fair shake for a long time in terms of employment and compensation. Uh, African Americans, black people haven't got, we, we need to lift in every level of life opportunities for education. So one thing I'm learning to do is that I need to lift. And the last thing, it ought to help me lead. We need leaders. Now, let me tell you, you're a leader. It might be in your home. It might be uh, in your church, your small group. It might be in your community. It might be in a civic club. Everybody listening now, how are you going to lead? I hope you can give some discussion. What kind of leader can I be? What can I do? It means that we must humble ourselves. 
Now, Jesus was the leader, but he was always, he wanted somebody else to take the credit. While everybody else wanted the top, he took a towel and washed the disciples' feet. Leaders don't wait for the crowd to affirm them. Leaders just step out and lead. Let me remind you, if you want to lead the orchestra, then you've got to turn your back on the crowd. In fact, there's an interesting term called dog leadership. I think it came out of South Georgia. Back in the old days when a farmer and would take the wagon and the horses and they would go into town, as they were going along towards town, the dog would go along out in front. But they said that whenever they'd come to a fork in the road, the dog would lag back and see which way the wagon was going and then he would run back up to the front of the wagon and keep leading. He didn't show them which route to take. He wanted to see which way they were going and then he would jump out. We don't need leaders today who are waiting to see which way things are going and well, we'll jump out that. We need leaders who will step out, step up, speak out, speak up, and to lead in churches, in groups, in everything. We, we need leaders. Esther 4, that powerful thing, when, when she had an opportunity to lead, remember they said to her, who knows, it was such a moment as this that you might have been born. So I hope you'll lead. What am I going to do in race relations? Now I want you to spend some time talking, what are you going to do? What is your group? What can you all do? Improving race relations. What can you do? To summarize, here's what I I'm going to try to do. I'm listening to God and people. I'm learning what God can do. I'm leaning on God for strength and direction. I'm striving to love all people. I'm looking for ways to lift people. I'm standing up to lead. Now, that's what I can do. And I just want you to discuss a little bit and ask you the question. What's your plan of action? What is it? Hey, thank you for giving me this privilege. There's some resources that uh, both uh, every morning, I do a one minute program, a one minute talk on radio and Facebook. Uh, you, information is there for you to access that. I do a blog each week. You can receive it by email. I do a, a a video once a week that's professionally produced and uh, that you might find it helpful. I do a good news every morning at 10 o'clock. Just a brief message of good news. These are just a few things I'm trying to do. The big thing is God's got a great plan for you and what you can do. Lean on him. Learn from him. Follow him. And he's got a plan. And hey, thank you for the privilege to let me share what I'm planning to do. God bless you.